Hey everyone, this is Carlos. I am the founder and CEO at Product School. Today I'm here with Ryan Glasgow, who's the founder and CEO at Sprig. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you, Carlos, and thanks for hosting me once again. I think this is our third or fourth time now doing an interview over the course of many years. You and I go way back, um, <laughs> even before you started uh, your company. You also had the honor of being the first guest uh, that we had on the podcast when your company was called UserLeap. And a lot of amazing things have happened since then. So let's kind of catch up the audience. <laughs> um, tell you a bit more about, about your background, and then we'll dive into, uh, dive into your current company. Yeah. Uh, my background's been in product management, and I actually really got started with some early stage companies, you know, pre-product. And, you know, at the time, they were so early, they actually didn't have a product manager. It was too early for these companies, you know, writing their first lines of code and figuring out their first concepts. And so I really cut my teeth as a uh, product designer and also a front end engineer. Uh, but given that there was not a, you know, product manager at the company, I was able to really fill that gap and get that exposure and then quickly moved into a uh, formal product management capacity before um, eventually starting Sprig, where I'm now CEO. And you mentioned front end development, you mentioned design. What was the status of user research? Who was wearing that hat back in the day? Back then, it wasn't done very often because product management was still in the technology space, a new function. And product management back, you know, over 100 years with Procter Gamble, but in the technology space, it is still very new. And, you know, pioneers like Product School are helping really bring that role to life and educating folks in that role. But at the time, you know, it was, there weren't very many. I often would show up at companies, they'd ask, what does a product manager do? You know, why are you here? Um, and so it was really help actually at the time helping form that role and define that role at many of the companies I was joining. So I can imagine that based on your own experience building, uh, you would be started to scratch your own itch and create a company that was solving one of your problems. So tell us a bit more about that problem that you saw in the market that you, none other solutions out there were, were really covering. You know, as a product manager, um, it was certainly... Um, you know, research was just so critical for everything that we were working on. And, you know, what I found is that companies either don't have researchers. And so the product managers have to do, you know, the research themselves, but then also you have companies where they do have researchers. So researchers can only cover a small fraction of the product questions and the research that the product managers are looking for. And so with Sprig, what we're doing is we're just really focused on if you have a research team, helping the research team and the product management team work uh, faster and, you know, really work together on reliable research and getting research and insights into all the decisions that, you know, product teams are making. And then for companies that don't have researchers, it's really about how we can have the designers, product managers, marketers conduct their own research. And, you know, as a product manager, um, you know, to your earlier question, it was up to the product manager to do all the research. And, you know, I've seen, you know, we, we will always want really great research, uh, but that can be difficult to do with people who don't have the time or the expertise in that field. And so Sprague, we're really focused on really bringing research to life in companies of all sizes, um, helping include everyone in that research process, but also give researchers the full control uh, to support all the stakeholders that they're working with on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, I've, it sounds to me similar to what happened with the uh, intersection between engineering and product or design and product, where back in the day, like, PMs would have to rely heavily on uh, another team just to get stuff done. And that might be the right approach when your company is big enough and has the, the resources. But we saw how some tools were able to bridge the gap and allow PMs to be a little, a little bit more self-sufficient and be able to get some stuff done and at the same time be able to delegate when needed. And that usually happened with engineering, data, I've seen it with design. User research wasn't at the same level, at least based on my own experience. So I'm glad to see that now there is something out there that is allowing PMs and other teams that are not researchers to do a little bit of research and at the same time, have the full capability to then go out there and really involve a research team. Is that is that the approach? That's exactly correct. Yeah, and you see engineering, we're shifting to no code, where everyone can be more involved in the building process. You know, I think Figma is a great example of bringing more people into the design process. You know, I remember 10 years ago, 
uh, you know, no one wanted to get your 200 megabyte Photoshop file just to review, you know, what it looked like or be able to leave a comment. It was incredibly cumbersome and difficult to bring other people into the design process. And so, you know, the data analysis process, more and more people can be involved by new tools and business intelligence and analysis. And, you know, absolutely with Sprig, it's bringing more people into the research process. In some cases, bringing people to help do the research themselves, but other cases really just to be involved in the data and the results and the insights, just knowing how critical all the data is. How can you really ensure this data permeates through every, every organization? So let's break down the concept research because from the outside it might sound scary, right? There's so many ways you can approach research. So in your own experience, what are some of the different like avenues for, for PMs to get some insights from their users? We, um, you know, what I hear and talking to Marty Kagan, he was on our podcast uh, a couple months ago and, and he said that 90% of product management is actually a value to research. You know, it's really evaluating um, the value of whether you should move forward with a particular feature, maybe even an idea or hunch or hypothesis. And so really making sure that this is something that's the top of the prioritization set. But the second part of evaluative research is actually evaluating existing experiences that you've already shipped and really understanding that feature that you launched last month or the feature that you're about to launch maybe next week, making sure that it's going to meet customer needs and they're going to understand it and it's going to really achieve the outcomes that you're looking for. There's also some genitive research, you know, very early on about doing, you know, more one-on-one -on -one customer interviews, more mod moderated. But um, given that most product managers, you know, you have a set of features that you're looking to build and you're really honing on what maybe the exact prioritization. And then again, evaluating whether you're delivering those features in the right way. And that's really where we focus with Sprig is on the evaluative research, knowing that's the bulk of what most companies are doing today. For me, something that was really transformational was when I realized that it was possible to run research inside the product. What I mean by this is that traditionally, when I hear that term, I would default to, okay, let's run a survey, right? Let's kind of strategize on identifying certain users, sending them something, taking them out of the experience, give them an Amazon gift card to respond and then get the insights. But that was really kind of not organic. What we are seeing in different products now is that you can get those insights on the spot while the user is executing any specific action. Like maybe they purchased something and you ask them, how was that experience? Or they found the bag and you ask them how, what happened. Like allowing the user to give you information on the spot, I think is really, really powerful because the time to value is much shorter. Yes. And that's the key innovation really with Sprague. And that was really the aha moment for me uh, is can we actually get the insights in the moment? And I think everyone's tired of getting that 50 question survey, you know, that you describe with that $50 or hundred dollar, even, you know, $150 Amazon gift card. And it's asking you questions about things from three months ago. You know, with Sprig, what we're doing is in context research and really breaking those research questions up into bite-sized pieces of just one or two questions at a time and really spreading around all those different questions to thousands of different people. And, you know, Carlos, maybe you, uh, you know, try a product for the first time or you try it and don't come back. And those are great contextual moments where we can ask maybe just one or two questions. And it really allows the users to co-create and really help you shape an award-winning product and um, through in-context research. And that's really what, what, again, what we're focused on and have really pioneered here at Sprig. And I like the term you use, the co-create, because I think it's a lot of emphasis on, oh, we're going to ship something new. We should do some research to validate if, if users will want it or not. And that's, that's okay. There's also a bunch of other users who are already in your product who are already interacting with it. And, and I think it's also important to apply research to them to understand how you can make the existing product better, to not just bring on new users. Because at the end of the day, as, as we think about growth, yes, it's important to acquire more, but it's also even more important to retain and provide value for the people who are already inside. Yes, yeah. And that's one of the key, you know, prior to starting Sprig, I had used panels where you talk to hypothetical people and you put them in hypothetical situations. And Carlos, you could imagine maybe talking to an analyst and let's say they want to switch to, you know, product management hypothetically, and you did research with them, you know, you wonder how valuable that would be putting people in those hypothetical situations. 
where with Sprig, you know, our we have very strong opinions on doing research with people who are actually in those situations. And so, you know, let's connect you with people with Sprig in the marketing website, you know, in your marketing website, maybe for product school, check the people considering product school, you know, in that moment right now, uh, let's actually talk to those people and build relationships and ask them questions. Um, and so, you know, we see with Sprig uh, asking people in, you know, the actual situations that they're in and getting those really key uh, questions asked in front of them, as opposed to the hypothetical, which have I personally seen, you know, steer people the wrong way. Um, and so definitely a big focus for us and our customers. So Ryan, give us an update uh, for your company for the last year. Like last time we spoke, it was a very different stage of your company. And I saw a really awesome post on, on your LinkedIn recently. So please give us an update. It's yeah, thank you. And it's been a fantastic 2021 for us. We started the year with 16 uh, you know, full-time employees and ended last year with 70 full-time folks and with around 20 to 30 contractors. So around a hundred total uh, on our headcount. And then also looking at, you know, revenue, we grew revenue a thousand percent, you know, last year alone. And we signed on some really great marquee customers, Dropbox, Loom, Adobe, Shift and Open Door are the ones I can publicly mention. I wish I could mention uh, many more, but we don't have, unfortunately, the logo rights for some really great customers that I unfortunately cannot mention today. Um, and then we won five, you know, best place to work awards. So we're, you know, hiring across the board. So if anyone's interested in helping us really evolve and transform the research industry, we would encourage you to apply on our website, sprig.com. Um, and, you know, number one on product hunt multiple times. And so that was also nice validation for just the market interest and really what we're working on as a company. So let's talk about what's happening in the market because 2021 has been incredible for a lot of other companies that are targeting product managers. Some of them went public, some of them raised crazy amounts of funding. You also closed an amazing funding round. So what do you think is, is happening across the board for these type of companies? We're definitely seeing research being more and more involved in the product development process. And again, like you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was just very informal. Maybe some product managers were conducting research, but we're seeing a huge growth of research teams. And so, you know, people are hiring researchers earlier in the company stages. They're also hiring more researchers. They're also encouraging everyone to be involved in that research process. Uh, designers, product managers, marketers to really ensure that they're shipping the best possible outcomes for customers. And I think the main driver is the end user has far more choice and control than ever. And I think product-led growth is one of the key trends that's driving that. And you talk about, you know, Slack is one of the fastest growing companies and Twilio and Datadog, and they're all employing product-led growth. But what that means is that the end user has all of the control in the buying process. And so, you know, B2C research is becoming more and more critical and research teams are growing significantly within B2C because there's just more companies, you know, maybe 10 years ago, a user had a choice of five, you know, digital banks. Now there's going to be a hundred different digital banks that they can choose from. But I think the more surprising trend is actually the increase in research for B2B companies. And what we're seeing again with product led growth is that the buying decision is often made by the end user. And so, you know, right now we're even looking at a task management solution for our engineering team. And the engineers are the ones actually doing the research and trying the different vendors to see which ones to choose. It's not, you know, our head of engineering who's doing a few sales demos and making that decision. And so a lot of B2B companies are now coming to us and saying, hey, you know, we, we really understand what's working and not working with the decision maker or the buyer with our software, but we have hundreds or thousands of end users and they're ultimately making the decision of whether to renew with this vendor or not you know, with this customer's uh, software. And so we're seeing this shift of research increasingly becoming critical for B2B and the product teams are actually going out to the end users and actually and oftentimes skipping the actual buyers and admins of those accounts, which has been a really interesting trend of how research is now becoming more pervasive in the enterprise and B2B space, in addition to historically where it's been mostly run um, consumer spaces. I agree. I, I've seen this shift in how business is done. 
uh, in many, many different industries um, based on what you said, a product-led growth approach, in B2B mostly, which is really allowing the end user make their own decision because they don't need an approval for that. Like we are seeing a lot of these companies that are offering users, uh, it could be a free trial, it could be even a free version of the product where they can get value, they can invite others, they can get to a point where they validate that this is good. And by the time that bubbles up to actually the person who's supposed to try to sign the check, it's just a no brainer, right? Because the adoption yeah. is there. And, and it's not that we're taking a big risk to sign a big contract and see if people use it. Like people are using it. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Exactly. And that's exactly what we're seeing. And I think a surprise definitely. And so that's why we're seeing now a, a big influx of B2B companies coming to us and where we've been a part of their transformation. So give me an example on how you are applying product-led growth for some of those big enterprise clients who might not be, you know, like they're going through data transformation. They're not like your typical high-tech companies who are really familiar with user research. Yeah. For us and how we're employing PLG? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, we, you know, PLG has been critical for our strategy and we want to, again, just really proud of our product and want to get in the hands of our customers as soon as possible. And so that's why today anyone can sign up for a free account. They can try a sprig, you know, on their own without talking to us. And so, you know, that's where we've seen companies, you know, Fortune 500, you know, some of the fastest growing tech companies all the way down to very early stage startups, all signing up and trying sprig and really experiencing the value on their own. And so, it's been a part of our growth last year and something that we'll continue to focus on um, into 2022. Yeah, and, and I, I want to send a message of um, reassurance for the sales folks out there. But this doesn't mean that sales is disappearing by any means, right? It means that now there's an entry point for anybody to, to, to get value from a product directly. You need to wait to schedule a demo or see a PowerPoint to see if this makes sense or not. Ultimately, I'm sure when, when the deal is big enough, requires a certain level of customization or anyway, a sales team is important to, to kind of push through the, through the finish line. But I think that seeing how the product can be part of that growth channel, how people can use it upfront before they commit to something, is ultimately good for the user. Yeah, and we're seeing the rise of sales assist as well. So, you know, anyone can create that account, sign up for the product, but introducing sales as really someone to help support and answer those discussions and questions along the way and just be a resource as people evaluate products on their own. And so that's you know, one area where we've really invested in is how can you really have our product and our sales team actually work together to ensure that that individual uh, is able to have all the information that she needs to make a decision. So at the beginning of the conversation, we talked about how there's some no-code tools that are allowing PMs to bridge the gap with design, with data, with engineering. Figma was an example for designers. Data analytics, there are so many examples. So how are you thinking about integrations and making sure that the data that you collect in your product is also easily accessible from other places? That's definitely a focus for us in 2022. And last year, we established partnerships with Amplitude. And so, you know, they wrote a fantastic blog post about us at the time we were called user leap. So <laughs> if you're looking for it, you have to look up user leap and amplitude and um, did a webinar as well about how companies like open door have been able to really bring together the quantitative and qualitative insights to make better decisions and grow faster. And so we did a webinar with a, the growth lead at open door about some really key insights that helped unlock growth for open door. And so, that's accessible uh, if you just Google for that and you'll find that webinar. And then Product Board as well. Product Board's been a key partner for us. And you know, at Sprig, we're really focused on the research space. And so we've been establishing partnerships with other companies that product managers also use. And those have been two that have been top of mind for us. And uh, our Zapier integration that we launched last year that was uh, on Product Hunt has been another key way to get all of the sprig data into all the other tools that product managers use and that could be into a slack instance it could be into you know we've seen uh, companies push data into data warehouses as well and what they're able to do is actually look at all their qualitative research data in conjunction with all the other data that they're collecting 
And so it's something that has been super powerful for our customers because they can pass the user ID and the event and attribute data all into Sprig. But then when they take the data out of Sprig, they, they know those user IDs, they know those emails, they know those events and attributes and timestamps of when that data was collected. And so they're able to get the holistic data of the customers, not only the revenue data, but also the, uh, the qualitative data, the analytics data, and pull that all together. And, and so it's just been fun seeing our customers take Sprig's data, enrich all the other data sets as well. And so that's one of the main ways we've been helping product managers you know, not have to do so much coding, you know, with traditionally APIs and other types of manual integrations to stitch those data sets together and get a more complete picture of their customer base. Yeah, th- those days are gone. Like I remember, remember those days when we had to piggyback on like Photoshop and PowerPoints and like whatever tools, but there wasn't anything really built from scratch for, for PMs. Now we're seeing an entire product stack out there that's allowing PMs to really pick the best products for different use cases. And that seems to be the, the most popular approach where there, there seems to be winners in, in research. Sprig is a really good example or in design with Figma, you mentioned product board for road mapping or amplitude for analytics, how all of these tools are making it easy to integrate with, with each other instead of trying to reinvent the wheel and, and try to cover all kinds of use cases and giving the PM the flexibility to pick what they think is best for each case and at the same time to have a unified view of the data so they can make decisions in an easy way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, I think the more that, you know, other companies can forge those partnerships, you know, we're starting looking for those. And if companies think they're the right partner for us, we'd love to hear from them because, you know, in jobs to be done, you're never going to be the entire, you know, you're going to be the vendor to complete the entire job. There's always going to be other vendors involved. And so, you know, you, you create more value by building those relationships and then helping the end customer, uh, ideally without any code, like you said, no code, to really complete those outcomes and have that data shared across all the other workflows that someone might be using. So if you think about the evolution of user research in terms of technology, we went from maybe pen and paper and mystery shopping to some sort of surveys and user groups to now, pure technology that is visual, that's allowing people to, to see stuff without throwing a single line of code. What is kind of the next big way for user research? That's a, yeah, so we're obviously a huge believer in in-context research. And so we think that we're just scratching the surface and getting more and more of the research out of long email surveys and out of you know one hour interviews that people also don't have time for and getting it more into you know, bite-sized, in-context research experiments. You know, hopefully everyone is, uh, listening is nodding their head that they would prefer to do, you know, a short async video question uh, for one or two minutes instead of a one hour interview. Um, and so I think we're just getting started with, you know, shifting uh, companies from this longer research that, you know, can really a lot of people don't have time for um, and customers becoming less and less interested in to more in context, you know, bite-sized research where there's just a huge appetite from the end consumer and end customer to participate in. Um, and so, you know, I think that's really the, the main focus for us. And there's just so many different requests around, you know, now it's AR and VR headsets. How can we actually integrate into those experiences? And we have a lot of customers now that have Apple TV apps. And so integrating Sprig into, you know, the living room, uh, I feel like we're just getting started with you know, collecting that research in the moment and something that uh, is going to take us a while to really accomplish. Something that I, I saw from your product was um, opportunity to gather insights from open-ended questions, which is pretty incredible because usually in service, you want to put like close-ended questions so you can group information and come to conclusions. So when you mention AI and other technologies, how are you able to kind of collect or merge information from people who are giving different answers on an open field? Definitely something that we've been working on since the very beginning of the company is our in-house developed artificial intelligence. And so have an amazing team of uh, AI engineers. Now we have four folks building this and what it's able to do, we had a customer actually just uh, last week, they collected 4,000 open text responses in a single day. 
And so many of our customers now at scale, they're collecting 10,000, 20,000 responses in a given week across their Sprig uh, studies. And what the AI is able to do is look through all the responses for a single question. And it's able to group all those responses into themes unique to that survey question. And so, you know, it's gonna be specific to the customer, it'll be specific to the study, it'll be specific to the study question. We don't reuse any of the themes across our customers. It's all custom and really developed by the AI looking through all the responses that, you know, we're collecting. Um, and it also does that for the voice and video data as well. And so if you do an asynchronous interview and we've seen customers get hundreds of video responses in you know, 20 different languages, it's able to translate and transcribe all of the audio data, run that through the AI and then surface up the themes across all those responses. And so technologically, it's something that, you know, we haven't seen done before. We're really proud and impressed with what we build. And we're seeing so many new use cases from our customers of having these conversations of voice and video with people around the world in different time zones and different languages. And again, conducting research in a way that, you know, we haven't seen done before, but also uh, our customers have just really enjoyed for, for the first time, really understanding that international audience. So as, as we wrap up this interview, I want to go back to talk about you because I've known you even before you started this company and, and you mentioned how much it's grown, right? So as a, as a founder, CEO, product person, how have you had to evolve to be able to stay, to keep it up, to continue innovating while also creating space for other leaders in your organization to, to shape your vision? That's a great question. And, you know, one of the biggest things I would say for any high growth startup, whether you're someone who's just joining as an individual contributor, you know, in management or, you know, founder or CEO yourself is that growth mindset. You know, and Carlos, I think you're the first instructor at product school and you know, now you're running a global organization, you know, with, uh, you know, it's very well funded and it's on this rocket ship growth. And I'm sure for you, you had to really figure out, you know, each step of the way from being an instructor to now, you know, managing uh, managers and leaders of instructors themselves. And, you know, Sprig is no different. In the early days, I was designing and coding and, you know, building a product. And then the second phase was really selling, you know, founder led sales. And I never worked at a company with a salesperson before. And so selling a product to, you know, high growth tech companies like Square and Dropbox, you know, certainly something I had to learn, you know, on the fly and no pressure, your company, you know, fails if you can't figure it out. Um, and then now though, we're 70 people and it's really thinking around, you know, culture and, you know, making sure that everyone's, you know, doing their best work here at Sprig and bringing on the right people. Um, and so it's really that growth mindset. If you're someone who, you know, really enjoys figuring out new things and can really stay ahead of the company needs. That's probably going to be the main limiting factor of your company's growth is, you know, as a CEO or founder or uh, someone on the leadership team, how quickly can you figure out the next phase of growth? And that's certainly looking outside of, you know, your company. It could be podcasts or articles or advisors and mentors. Um, and so I'm just so focused on the learning. You know, I've been described as a hyper learner. Um, and that's, I think, really what's enabled the growth that we've seen at Sprig and something that as we grow and, and cover new uncharted territory will become increasingly important for, for me to, to really think through. Love that, Ryan. And I can attest to that. At, and, and I love that attitude of like, OK, this is what we need to figure out. I'm going to go and make it happen. And I think it's also very important to realize when when it's enough, when it's time to delegate or hire so you can focus on that next big challenge. And I've seen you do that kind of time after time. And, and I like that you talk about culture because I think that's one of those underrated terms that sound very wishy-washy, especially at the very beginning because the first employees know each other. They're working from the same room, maybe. And now as you are building a global organization with so many different perspectives in mind, it's really important to capture those, those insights and, and kind of drink our own champagne and, and make sure that people are feeling productive, happy, and there's also room for them to, to grow. So thank you so much for your time, Ryan. It's, it's always a pleasure to, to see you grow. And I hope we can have you again uh, at some point. Happy to join anytime. Thanks again for having me. And yeah, Carlos, it's been fun seeing Product School grow into what it is and really excited to continue uh, following your journey. Thank you.